Let's talk about performance first, though, because what's stunning is you've seen this massive melt up in markets and the hedge funds, by and large, across the industry really have not kept up. Bloomberg's all hedge index is only up about 4.8 percent through the year so far. And the multi strats, which are supposed to be the kings of the castle here, are only up less than 3 percent on the year. Alana, what's going on? OK, so let me unpack those numbers. Um, first off, the hedge fund index, I think, is a blend of everything. So we need to kind of go strategy by strategy to really pull out what the themes are. Long short equities, which had a really tough 21 and 22, finally, Shanali had performance. I am pleased to sit here and say something positive, which I have not been able to do for the last couple of years. Those funds, which are a big percentage of the hedge fund universe, the directional, concentrated, tiger cubs, and similar, are up as much as 20%, 30%, even 40%. The issue there which is really important, is even though they're up that much, they still have, for the most part, an enormous high watermark to have to get out of. And let's just say it's a fund that's up 35% this year, OK? You may think, and they were down about 50% between 21 and 22, you may think, OK, year one this year, up 35, they can get out of that remaining 15 or 20 next year, and then it's smooth sailing. But the reality is their AUM maybe was $13 billion at the beginning of 21. It's $6.5 billion now. So that 35% is on a much smaller base of capital. And it's actually, as a result, so there are very, much fewer dollars made um, than it would have been had they made that money back up before they had the losses. And as a result, there's really another 65% to go. So that's a huge headwind for that um, uh, 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 strategy. How much more excitement is there around the industry, especially because uh, many of them have not met the market performance still? And so even if they're up, they have two issues here, to your point, the high watermark. And the issue is uh, you could just invest in the S&P or the NASDAQ or even the SOX up 65 percent this year. How does that set them up into appetite, investor appetite, for new hedge fund allocations next year? Well, let me also touch on the multi-managers, which you cited. It is true that blended, it's not a great result. But unpacking that, there's a lot of dispersion in that result. If you look at the more established multi-managers, um, that have been around a while and have built a mousetrap that is very difficult to compete with, funds like Citadel leading the pack up 15%, which is a very different number than what you cited, or Millennium, 0.72, up double digits. And then the rest are struggling. And that has a lot to do. So when we, to answer your question, LP appetite, you know, the reality is the reason the other multi-managers grew so quickly is because the more established players were either closed or very deliberate about how they grew. And if you can't allocate to the more established guys, or at least not at the level you'd like, then you end up pouring money into all these other funds that grew in the last two years hand over fist. And when I say quickly, I mean between 3 and 8x. Think about that. Over a 24 to 36 month period, it is very difficult to deploy that kind of capital growth and and hire a winning team in order to do that. Talent is really difficult to hire and attract. No one knows that better than myself and my team. And so um, you can't get from 1 billion to 8 billion, hire 150 PMs and expect a great result. There's a lot more that goes into this. OK, well, let's talk about talent, because I feel like it was you know, pandemic era where all we were talking yep. about was the competition to talent and co compensation wars, who can offer uh, the best starting salaries and the biggest bonuses. We know that it has been a more difficult year in terms of actually people getting, getting paid. And we're probably finding that out uh, here at the tail end of the year. So what is your view here on, on compensation and how these firms are making themselves attractive? I think um, compensation kind of falls into one of two buckets. It's either formulaic. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you're at a multi-manager with a pass-through, you know exactly what you're getting paid. There's no mystery there. Or you're at a fund, um, which is like a single manager, where you, if you're a senior person, you have points in the fund. And then there's maybe a jump ball with respect to being able to reward you on top of that. But to the extent it's a fund that has a high, high watermark, 
There is no, there hasn't been a performance fee for, for example, the long short equity managers in 21, for the most part. There wasn't one in 22. And even though they put up this incredible performance in 23, they don't have a performance fee with which to pay those people. And so to answer your question, I think there's going to be a lot more frustration this year than there even has been the last couple of years. Those people are going to get paid more because the manager is going, the founder is going to feel he or she needs to reach more deeply into the management fee to pay them. But when you're someone who's put up hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars, the dispersion between what you're actually going to get paid this year and what you've produced is going to be very frustrating versus in previous years where there wasn't performance for the fund. I didn't put up performance as an individual, so whatever I get paid, I'm kind of OK with, because that's the ethos of this industry. It's pay for performance. Now I've put up tremendous performance, and my founder isn't really paying me something that feels in any way proportionate to what I should get paid. And I want to also highlight, as much as some of these funds lost a significant amount of AUM, we're still we're talking about falls from grace of $30 billion to $20 billion, or in the case of Tiger Global, $100 billion to $55 billion. But think about the management fee on 55 billion. That's still a billion of fees. Or on 20 billion, that's 400 million of fees. So, and these teams are relatively lean, particularly at senior levels, and everyone knows that. So it's, um, it's early still vis-a-vis -vis comp, but what we're hearing, even though the number is better, is an increased level of frustration. And I think there's going to be more vulnerability at these funds as a result. When I left the street in the mid-2000s, I studied long and hard about whether to transition to the hedge fund business. And what I concluded then was that long, short equity, uh, no alpha left. Done. Game had been played out. So I came to Bloomberg. So <laughs> my question is. And how lucky we are, Paul. And I was absolutely correct. The numbers bear that out. Um, my question is, if I'm a really good trader, I don't know, bonds, currency, something at Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, back in the day, I could just leave and go raise a couple billion dollars, and then boom, that was my path. Does that still exist, or does a lot of the new money coming into hedge funds go to the point seventy twos and the Citadels? Well, as I said earlier, some of those established managers are closed or very carefully accepting right. new capital. And believe me, there's a line around the block to yep. allocate yep. to those. <laughs> but uh, two things. One, the days of leaving the sell side to go start a hedge fund, I think you'd have to be completely nuts to try to attempt to do that. Right. Good luck getting a job at a hedge fund, period, because you've spent all this time on the sell side. And back in the day, Sorry, not yep. to age you, but when you were there, the case. you could take risk, <laughs> sure. right? You could take risk. You can't do that post the financial yep. crisis. So if you're still sitting on the sell side, the reality is you're in more of a managerial role than you yep. are a risk-taking role at yep. a senior level. Um, I think it's candidly become more difficult to even launch coming from um, most hedge funds. Now, coming from a top flight hedge fund, which has a great established track record and is doing well today, that's exciting to LPs. But that group of funds has become fewer and fewer. And yes, coming out of a fund like a Citadel or a Point 72 sets you up in good stead to be able to launch successfully. But think about coming out of some of the Tiger Cubs are related now mm -hmm. that are still well below their high water mark. Yep. That's not exactly an exciting value proposition to LPs to say, oh, I'm going to be different, you know, and don't sort of don't worry about the last <laughs> 21 and 22. You know, we're doing better now, and um, I my approach to risk management and um, managing volatility is is better than what you've experienced. Also embedded in Paul's question here is there's the long short equation has been doing better, but macro has been such an exciting prospect. Currencies, fixed income, uh, the interest rate environment so drastically changing. When you're looking at uh, the types of managers, how much is the macro story part of 2024 and what does that mean for the talent story? That's a good question, Shanali, because every year I feel like it's a different story in macro. 22 was great. Uh, 23 has not been so great, so we'll see what 24 holds. It's a strategy which embodies, as we've seen, a lot of volatility. So um, I think it's TBD in terms of how they will perform. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, talent follows where there is an ecosystem which, will, which can navigate that volatility best. We're now in an 
environment, an interest rate environment that haven't been in a long time where with rates went up so much, and now they're going to be coming down. Is there a feeling within the hedge fund community that certain strategies are going to work better in 24 than maybe the past couple of years? Well, I think um, the reality is the, uh, you know, it, the bar has gone up in terms of um, not just the, just the market environment, but also what LPs expect for what they're paying. And it's really the focus is, is of course, on alpha and running in a way which um, neutralizes a lot of the market risk inherent right. that has whipsawed um, a lot of the return for funds. Uh, factor rotations um, really has obscured great fundamental stock picking. And so being somewhere which can uh, isolate what is value, growth, um, momentum, uh, macro cross currents and hedge those things out so that great idiosyncratic alpha driven stock picking can shine through. That, that's the most important thing because then it doesn't matter what the market's doing. Yep. You know, interestingly, I want to comment on something you had talked about a little earlier. We were talking about the success of Citadel in Multistrat, but it's also worth talking about the undertone of the other side of that story. You had mentioned that some firms grew so fast, so quickly, and the poster child of that this year was really Schoenfeld. This idea that a lot of money was pulled, billions of dollars was pulled from the firm. Uh, you know, they really had to look to raise capital to really fill that whole, they even considered merging with another large multi-strategy firm. Is Schoenfeld alone? Is there other struggles that we're seeing in firms like Schoenfeld, and how does that play out into next year? Totally. I, uh, you know, all these funds that grew so quickly, whether, I, I mean, I'm just, not to, just to talk about who's grown hand over fist, these funds are multiples, AUM-wise, of where they were even two years ago. LMR, Hudson Bay, Synctiv, Schoenfeld, as you mentioned, Verition, and you can't do that. You have to be far more deliberate with respect to thinking about what is the end state? How many PMs do I want so that I can maximize idea generation and minimize um, crowding risk and then execute against that and only grow as you've been able to attract talent. And I don't mean bodies, I mean talent. And talent always has options, right? If you're that good, the reality is as one of those multi-managers that grew very quickly, you're up against the Citadels, the Point 72s, the Baliasnys of this world, the Millenniums competing for those people. So what are you offering that's really a differentiated value proposition? And when I hear of a fund, and this is an actual fund that grew 8x in that period and hired a, and is now has 150 PMs with no real team underneath any of those PMs, and the PMs they attracted are really science experiments. Most of them have not been PMs before, don't know how to run risk in a market neutral model, and there's no real resources at the firm to make them better. That's a recipe for disaster. And what we've learned is being a successful multi-manager is not as simple as capital, a pass-through, and PMs. It is far more nuanced than that. 